God, just be with him. Be with us, Lord. Make us attentive. Help us to hear. And bring, Lord, those truths that we need to take into our hearts, into our lives, so that, Lord, we can incorporate them and apply them so that, Lord, we can be the men that you've called us to be here at Ridgeview, and in our families, in our workplaces, and in our community. We just ask this in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Pastor. Let me get this up. Hold on a second, guys. So guys, evening at Bethlehem, Dave's not the best marketer, okay? Mike Mantia is cooking. If you like Mike's cooking, come to evening at Bethlehem. It's really good. Um, I volunteered, I think, the past three or four years. Um, it's just kind of a blessing. Last year, I was able to uh, sit with the cars and pray with people as they were leaving. And man, you wouldn't believe how this impacts people like, I had people crying in the car. I had just people just with all kinds of problems. You're asking them how you can pray for them. It was just really a neat thing to see how it really, truly impacts the people that are coming through. So I'd encourage you to get involved with that. If you guys have a Bible, turn to Philippians 4. We're going to be in verses 1 through 7 tonight. And I'm just going to start by reading the text, and then we're going to kind of dig into this. Uh, it says, therefore, my beloved and longed for brethren, my joy and crown. So stand fast in the Lord, beloved. I implore Odia and I implore Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And so, guys... This text, we're going to split it up into four main sections, but the first thing that I want to mention here is that Paul is dealing with a conflict, and it's a, it's a woman fight. It's between two women, Odia and Syntyche, okay, and he's addressing this issue between these two women. They were obviously conflicting, and they were of different mindsets, and there was something happening there to where he was basically instructing some of these other men to come in and help them to resolve this conflict, okay? What we know about this conflict is that it was serious. A lot of scholars believed it was very serious, serious enough that he was addressing this in a letter. It required mediation, so it required these men to come in and notice that being a Christian did not prevent them from coming into conflict. And being in ministry did not prevent them from coming into conflict because they're walking in flesh, right? What we know about Paul is he was no stranger to conflict either. If you look earlier in his ministry, he had this big tiff with uh, Barnabas. They disagreed on the second missionary journey about bringing Mark along because Mark had deserted them previously, and so Paul didn't trust him. And so him and Barnabas, they fight to the point where they separate and they part ways, okay? So he's no stranger to this, but what we know later on in his life is that they reconciled completely. He came back together with Barnabas. He eventually found this guy, Mark, that Barnabas uh, discipled as a useful helper, right? And then Mark goes on to serve Peter and record his book. So we can see when he's writing this book of Philippians, he's later in his life. This is shortly before he dies. So he's had all these experiences with conflict, and now he's addressing this conflict with these women from a place of experience. So let's look at how he addressed this. Notice the first thing that he points to is this statement, whose names are in the book of life. So he's instantly pointing them to the fact that their names are in the book of life. And guys, what this is, this is an identity statement. And what we see over and over again with Paul is when people were going through sins and they were stuck in all kinds of fleshly desires or they were stuck in conflicts, he's always pointing them to their identity. 
Every time, he points them to who they are in Christ. And here he's doing the same thing when he says, hey, you guys, your names are written in the book of life. So what does that mean when your name is written in the book of life? What we know about this book of life is that your names are written there from the foundation of the earth. In Psalm 139, it says, For you have formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they all were written. The days fashioned for me when as yet there was none of them. So notice, this happened before the foundation of the earth. He's writing our names in this book. It's kind of an amazing thing. It is a destiny statement that you are in this book, okay? And it weighs heavily in on who you are and your identity in the deepest part of you. Okay, And notice, the days were fashioned for us. We weren't created for the day. We weren't created for the creation. The creation was actually created for us. So think about that. That carries a lot of weight. And we know that the book of life has end times consequences. If we look into Revelation 3, it says, He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. So we see we have to overcome to not be blotted out of this book of life. So we really want to be in this thing. But then concerning the beast, it says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship the beast, whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And it also says, The beast that, was, that you saw was and is not, and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel, whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. So your name being written in this book of life means that when this beast comes, you are not going to be deceived. Does that make sense? That's kind of a big deal. Because the people that are deceived are going to not a good place. So this is a matter of identity. It also has implications in the judgment. It says, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So do you think that's important? That's an important detail, right? You want to make sure you're in there. It has implications with the new heaven and the new earth. It says, there shall in no wise enter into it, the new heaven and the new earth, anything that defiles, neither anything that works an abomination or makes a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. So we, we really want to make sure we're in there, don't we? It's pretty important. Question, can we be removed from the book of life? I'll just tell you what the scripture says. In Exodus 32, and, and just to remind you, this is under the old covenant, this is Moses speaking concerning the Israelites. Yet now, if you will forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray you, out of your book, which you have written. And the Lord said to Moses, whosoever has sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. So under the old covenant, if you were alive and you sinned against God, guess what? You would be blotted out of this book. And I thank God through Jesus Christ that under the new covenant, if I'm a repentant sinner and I come to him in true repentance, his blood covers my sin and I don't get erased from that book, okay? Revelation 22 says, and if any man shall take away from the words of the, the book of this prophecy, this book of Revelation, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Okay, so we don't want to mess with Scripture, do we? We don't want to mess with the Word of God because that will cause problems for us. But when we think about the book of life, I think the question is, what does it really mean? And we can find that in this text here in Psalm 69. Speaking of the adversaries, it says, Let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. So the fact that we are in the book of life means that we are righteous 
and we are written with the righteous. And that is our identity. Is it our righteousness? No. It's the righteousness of Christ living in us, the hope of glory, right? But that's what this is about. He is bringing them back to their identity. He's saying, you guys are fighting, you're in conflict. Remember who you are. You're righteous. And righteous people don't do this, okay? So that's what he's saying there. He brings them back to identity. And then he continues. He says, let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. And that word gentleness and the word meekness are kind of interchangeable there. In some translations, it says gentleness. In some translations, it says meekness. But what meekness is, is not weakness. Does that make sense? Meekness is actually strength. Not only is it strength, it's a tremendous amount of strength under control. Um, I used to travel a lot. I uh, would travel four days a week, typically, for about 10 years I did that, I'm traveling salesman. And I flew in all kinds of planes. I flew in very small, tiny private planes. I flew in big planes. Uh, I remember flying these small private planes. And when you, you go over the mountains to come in for a landing, man, it's all over the place. You feel like you're losing your stomach. The thing will drop, I don't know how many feet, just all of a sudden. And when you come in for a landing, it's very rocky, okay? It's very loud. You can't miss a landing, okay? But I remember mentioned this morning, I was on a flight with Pastor Dave going to Kenya, and this thing was massive. It was one of these big, I don't know if it was an Airbus, but this was the biggest plane I've been on, hundreds and hundreds of people, and you didn't even feel turbulence in this thing. And when this thing came and touched down, it's like you didn't even know the plane had landed, okay? Tremendous amount of power under control. It comes down. It's nice and smooth. It's gentle. Does that make sense? So if we're talking about gentleness, it's really important to understand who Moses was. So this particular text, it comes from a situation. Moses had married a woman. I think she was an Ethiopian woman. And Miriam, his sister, and Aaron, they rose up against Moses. In that particular instance, they didn't like something and they rose up against him. And this statement here is made, and this is kind of God defending who Moses was. And this is before Miriam gets struck with leprosy. But it says, now the man Moses was very humble or meek more than all of the men who were on the face of the earth. And that word for humble and meek, poor, afflicted, humble, or meek is what that Hebrew word means. So the question is, how did he get there? How did he become so meek that he was the most meek man on the earth? And when you look at his life, you look at his first 40 years, he was living his life according to his own strength. Okay, he was famous. He was probably rich, very wealthy. He was a part of the royal family. He was adopted into it. He had a lot of notoriety. He ends up killing an Egyptian out of his own strength trying to solve a problem and how did that work out for him? He ends up fleeing and going into the wilderness, right? And so I have this statement sanctioned by Pastor Matt this morning. He flees into the butt crack of the desert, basically, is what the scripture says. It's, it's the backside. It's the ugly part of the desert. So now he's in the ugly part of the desert for 40 years. And think about this. He went from all this notoriety to nobody cares who you are. Nobody knows who you are. You're basically nobody. You find a wife, you get married, and now you're shepherding your father-in-law's sheep. I want you to think about that, how humbling of an experience that would be. I love my father-in-law. I have a great, great relationship with my father-in-law. I don't know if I'd want to work for my father-in-law shepherding his sheep, you know what I mean? But this is what he did for 40 years. So now Moses is 80 years, and most of the time when somebody's 80 years old, we think, okay, God's done with you. But that's when God was ready to start with Moses. He was finally poured out. All of his will, all of his own strength was gone. And now he was able to live according to God's strength in him. Does that make sense? And you could say that he was broken in spirit at that point. So much so that he didn't even think he could do what God wanted him to do. He said, I've got to stutter. I can't do this. 
Okay, he was emptied of everything. And we see a similar situation with King David. So King David, he had committed adultery, he had committed murder. He has this conversation and he realizes his sin instantly, okay? And he repents instantly. And he says this statement, for you do not desire sacrifice or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. So Moses, it takes him 80 years to get there. David, it takes him a conversation to get there. And for us, it could be anywhere in between that. You know, for me, I didn't come to a broken spirit till I was in my 30s. I spent a whole lot of time not in a broken spirit, doing what I wanted to do, doing things of my own strength. But for us, it could be a whole length of time. It could be a quick conversation and you immediately get to a broken spirit. But it's important to get to this broken spirit if we're going to put on gentleness, okay? Because when we get to a broken spirit, we're saying we are under an authority. It's no longer my authority. Now I'm under authority, okay? Moses had more authority than anybody with the exception of Jesus Christ in the history of man. Jesus had the most authority, and both of them were the meekest men that ever walked the earth. Think about that. Because they were both under authority, and we have to be under authority too. What we do a lot of times is we try to live according to the will. And what that means, there's a story that I heard recently that really represents this well. Um, it's about a little boy, and he's sitting in church, and he stands up on his chair or his pew, and his dad says, sit down. And so the boy sits down, and then he stands up again, and then the dad says, sit down. And he sits down and then he stands up again and the dad takes him and spanks him and says, sit down. And what the boy says back to him is, I'm going to sit down. You can see me sitting down, but inside I'm still standing up, right? So this is an example of somebody who is submitting by will, not by a broken spirit. And this is what we do all the time. As Christians, a lot of times we come into obedience to God but inside, there's a piece of rebellion. It's still in there. And we haven't addressed the rebellion. And because of that, we don't have a broken spirit. And because of that, we can't come into this gentleness that he's talking about. Does that make, a sen make any sense? The broken spirit is when there's no more of me left. It's I'm poured out. I got nothing to say, God. I've got no opinions. What do you want me to do? Like, tell me what to do. That's broken spirit. Does that make sense? Okay, so what we don't want to be is harsh. Harshness is a sign of weakness. These are people that are loud, they're abusive, they're threatening, they're out of control. And when you're all of these things, when you're in this weakness, you're in, in a danger of falling into the sin of the flesh called witchcraft. Okay, and what witchcraft is, it's trying to manipulate somebody, get somebody else to do what you want them to do through manipulation, through intimidation, through domination. Okay? That is a work of the flesh, and it is a sin of the flesh. And so we have to be careful. If we are weak, if we haven't come to a broken spirit, if we don't put on gentleness, we can very quickly get to this place of weakness. But what we want to be is strong in the Lord and living our lives by his strength. And that means that we're quiet, we're calm, we're intentional, we're in complete control. You know, I go to the gym. I've got a picture of this big muscle man up there. I don't know if you've ever seen a big muscle man exercise, but when he goes to lift these heavy weights, he's pretty smooth on lifting, right? He's got really good form. He's not shaking all over the place like some of us are, right? He's got good form because he's got all this strength under control. But when you see the skinny guy go into the gym and he hasn't ever lifted weights and he goes to bench press and he's all over the place and he can't hold anything stable, right? He's weak. But that's what it means to be loud and harsh and abusive and manipulative and dominating. It's a sign of weakness, not of strength. So if that's who you are with your wife, if that's who you are with your kids and all these things, just know you're not of a broken spirit. There's still something in you that's in rebellion. 
And we have to address that so that we can come into gentleness. Does that make sense? Okay. So, he's addressing a conflict. He reminds them of their identity in Christ. You're written in the book of life. That means you're righteous. You don't act that way. He's telling them to put on gentleness. And now he goes on. He says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. So this anxiety, he's addressing something. I went ahead and I looked up what the top causes of anxiety are for men. And this is the list that it gave me. Financial instability, career progression, health issues, relationship, marriage conflicts, family responsibilities, job security, physical appearance, aging concerns, social expectations, performance pressure, future uncertainty, public speaking, mental health stigma, peer comparisons, fear of failure, parenting worries, retirement planning, time management, work-life balance, social acceptance, debt management, changing economy, loneliness concerns, physical war coming. Can you guys relate to these things? Do any of these things bring you anxiety? They bring you worry, especially before the election. (laughs) They probably brought you a lot of anxiety, right? Now, when you layer on top of this, the anxiety for women It's that stuff in the middle. So for women, it's all of those things of men and the stuff in the middle, (laughs) okay? And the first thing is body image concerns. And I mentioned this to the guys this morning. Guys, that is a real cause of anxiety for our women and for our wives. Are we telling them that they're beautiful, okay? Inside and out. We can help our wives in that area. Relationship stability, family expectations, aging appearance, Social media comparisons, personal safety, home responsibilities, friendships drifting, marriage expectations, and self-esteem struggles. We got a whole lot of things that can make us anxious, don't we? So the issue with anxiety is a lot of times it triggers something, and what it triggers is the wrong thing. What it triggers is control. So I'm anxious about this. I'm immediately going to try and see how I can control this thing so that my fear subsides, right? But the issue with that is if I'm doing that, I'm trying to control something and this other person has anxieties and they're trying to control something and they come together, their methods of control conflict. Does that make sense? And now all of a sudden you have conflict. And the conflict is rooted in this one being anxious and fearful and this one over here being anxious and fearful. What I truly believe in this text, this issue between Odia and Syntyche had to do something with anxiety. They were worried about something. They were maybe worried about finances in the church. They were worried about how to go about the ministry. They were worried about maybe all kinds of things. But whatever their worry was, whatever their anxiety was, it was causing that conflict. And this is why Paul is addressing that conflict. So the issue is our trigger sends us to the wrong place. Paul's addressing what our trigger should be. When we have anxiety, what's the warning light lead to? What am I supposed to do with that anxiety? One of the best examples I've found is the story of King Jehoshaphat. And I love King Jehoshaphat. It's just a really one of the solid kings of the Old Testament. And I love reading about him. There's so much uh, that we can learn. It's very rich when you read about his life. But he had a situation where he had to deal with anxiety, a pretty serious form of anxiety. So I'm going to read a little bit of it. It says, this is in 2 Chronicles 20. It says, it happened after this that the people of Moab with the people of Ammon and others with them besides the Ammonites came to battle against Jehoshaphat. Then some came and told Jehoshaphat saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, from Syria. And they are in Hazazon Tamar, which is in Gedi. Uh, And Jehoshaphat feared. So he's getting anxious. He sees three kingdoms, armies coming against him. Would that make you afraid? It'd give me anxiety. Back in those days, it meant they were coming to kill you, your wife, your kids, everybody. Okay. Notice his response. He set himself to seek the Lord. That was his response. So he decided, I'm going to go seek the Lord on this. Did he say, I'm going to go try to control something? (laughs) 
Did he say, let me go get my generals together. We got to come up with a plan, you know, so my anxiety goes away. He didn't say any of that. He set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast through all Judah. So Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord. From all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. So now they're coming out to seek the Lord. They're proclaiming a fast, but they made that decision. We're going to go to seek the Lord. So now they go to the temple, and this is Jehoshaphat's prayer. He says, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? And do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand is there not power and might, so that no one is able to withstand you? Are you not God, who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel, and gave it to the descendants of Abraham for your, your friend forever? And they dwell in it, and have built you a sanctuary in it for your name, saying, If disaster comes upon us, sword, judgment, pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this temple and in your presence, for your name is in this temple, and cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear and save. And now here are the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and did not destroy them, well, here they are, rewarding us by coming to throw us out of your possession, which you have given us to inherit. O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, no, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are on you. So notice the components of this prayer, okay? He's admitting his anxiety. He's explaining to God the situation. He's pouring it all out, Okay. But then he's saying, God, remember your promises. And I believe in you. Remember your promises. And then he says, I don't know what to do. I don't have the slightest idea what to do next. But then he says, my eyes are on you. My eyes aren't on my circumstance. My eyes aren't on the source of my anxiety. My eyes are on you. Okay? This is how he addresses the Father. And God responds. God says, listen, all you of Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem and you, King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow go down against them. They will surely come up by the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. You will not need to fight this battle. Position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. And then Jehoshaphat goes, and he worships, and he thanks God. God, God didn't do it yet. He didn't do anything yet. He just said, here's what I'm going to do. And he just, Jehoshaphat just goes and worships. He believes God. He's not worried. He's worshiping, even though God has not moved yet, okay? And then what happens? He goes out, he tells the people, believe in the Lord, and he believes in the Lord so much that he sends the worship team out in front of the army. Think about that. Your front line is gonna be the worship team? <laughs> I don't know if Jeff Lowe and those guys can handle this, right? But they're your front lines, okay? That's the faith that he had, and you know what happens? These three armies turn on each other. They decide to kill each other. And there was a sea of dead bodies. Not even one of them was left. Think about that. All they did was stand there, just like God said, with their worship team out there. And these guys just wiped themselves out. And all Jehoshaphat had to do was go and collect the spoils. And it took them days to go and collect all of the spoils from all these men that had died in that battlefield. And then he goes off and he worships, and then God gives him rest. So look at this pattern. This pattern is amazing. And this is what Paul is trying to point to. When you have anxiety, you have to set yourself to seek the Lord on it. Don't go try to control it. Don't go to the place where you think, I'm going to mitigate this so that I feel less anxious. If you have anxiety, you go to the Lord. The next time you have anxiety, go to the Lord. Every time you go to the Lord. Does that make sense? So he goes to the Lord, ends a fast, goes to the temple, prays and pours his heart out, tells God, I've got my eyes on you in this. 
I'm not looking at my circumstance. He worships God before God even moves. Then God moves. He worships again. I mean, look at the pattern. This is what he's trying to show us. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything bring prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. So this is our instruction. This is what we're to do. And then he finished up this text. So he's managing the conflict. He's telling them their identity, who they are in Christ. You are righteous. You don't act this way. He's telling them to put on gentleness, the fruit of the spirit, not harshness. He's telling them, get rid of this anxiety because it's causing your conflict. Okay. And then he says, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So the question is, how does peace guard your heart and guard your mind? It's a good question. When we look at what the scripture says, or not what the scripture, but the definition of peace. Basically it means not being at war, harmony between people, security and freedom. It's the idea of serenity and tranquility. When you look at the Hebrew word for peace, it's shalom. And what shalom means is wholeness, okay? It means that if you don't have shalom, you're missing something, okay? Something's not there. And when people go out and they greet people in the marketplaces and they say shalom, and on the the Sabbath they say Shabbat shalom, okay, what they're wishing on you is wholeness, and it's a wholeness that only comes from God. It's not yours. It comes from him. So how does that guard over your heart and your mind? We've talked about the Hebrew language before and how it's kind of three-dimensional. There's a numeric dimension, there's a pictographic dimension on top of its normal dimension. And when you look at what the sages had to say about the pictography of the language in this word shalom, there's four Hebrew letters, pictures, that come in this word. The shin, the lamed, the vav, and the mem. And the shin means teeth that crush and destroy. The lamed means a shepherd's staff. And it also implies authority. The vav is an iron nail or a wooden hook. And that's something that fastens two things together. It connects them. Okay. And the mem is the waters. And it could mean life as a living stream or chaos as a flood or a tsunami. And when you look at what the sages believed, the deep pictographic meaning of this word was... They believed it was when the authority connected to chaos and confusion is destroyed. That's what peace means. Who destroys this? Christ, doesn't he? He's the only one that can destroy this. And so if he can come into your life, if he comes into your mind and he's sitting on the throne of your mind, he rules. This authority that's connected to chaos and confusion has to bow. Okay? You can see a Is this working? You can see a picture of Satan over here bowing. He's kneeling before this man who has Christ on the throne within him. Okay? This is peace. He's given you wholeness. He's given you Christ on the throne. And now that authority that's related to the chaos and confusion is being destroyed in your mind. And once it's destroyed in your mind, it can be destroyed in your family. And once it's destroyed in your family, it can be destroyed in the body. And once it's destroyed there, it can be destroyed in the community, in that order. Does that make sense? So this is how peace guards. This is a great lesson, guys. Managing conflict. Points to our identity. You're in the book of life. You're righteous. Put on gentleness, not harshness. This is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. You put it on. Stop being anxious. Take everything to God because that anxiety and your desire to control is causing you to fight and conflict with one another. And then peace. Put Jesus on the throne in your mind, in your heart, so that this authority associated with chaos and confusion is destroyed. Does that make sense? All right, let's say a quick prayer. Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you that uh, you constantly teach us and open up things for us and guide us and, and explain just the deep things of your word. And we're thankful for this hour, for these men, each and every one. Lord, I pray over them if they're anxious over anything, 
Lord, if they've got conflict in their lives, Lord, your word is so clear in how to deal with these things. And I just pray that we can walk in these paths in our very real situations that we're going through right now in our families and in our lives and at work and wherever. And Lord, I just pray that our, our conversations are in heaven. I pray that you uh, can move conversations the, the way that they need to go in our, in our meetings and our groups tonight. And I just ask that you protect us, protect our families, protect this fellowship of men, Lord. Sanctify this brotherhood. Let only love reside here with the...